Today we continue our study of Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. And in spite of what the bulletin says, we're just going to read the first seven verses of chapter 4. Chapter 4, the verses 1 through 7. Paul writes, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. And that is God's word. May he add his blessing to us as we meditate upon it today. But first, a few headlines. On Thursday, the Pope began a meeting in Rome, uh, which is still going on. And he called bishops and heads of religious orders from all over the world to try to deal with the, a decades-long scandal of priests abusing children, principally young boys. Just last week, a Texas newspaper reported that 380 Southern Baptist church leaders and volunteers have been accused of abusing more than 700 children since 1998. And it seems that even after their crimes had been discovered, some of these leaders were able to leave that church and, and keep working at other Baptist churches over the years. And of course, we've already mentioned the problems that the United Methodist Church is wrestling with today. Given all of this, it sure looks like the worldwide church is in a sorry state. But given what Paul mentions in verse 2, where he condemns the hidden things of dishonesty or shame, where he condemns walking in craftiness and deceit, where he condemns abusing the word of God in one way or another, we have to admit these problems are nothing new. Some who call themselves pastors, the word means shepherds, some who call themselves pastors have always abused their office to take advantage of the sheep. Proclaiming their love for Jesus while really only being concerned about themselves. And unfortunately, we could name lots of names, couldn't we? Yes, the problem of selfishness in the church is clear enough. We know very well what church leaders should not do. But what should we do? What positive model of church leadership should we embrace? Indeed, how can all of us live in such a way that we attract people to Christ instead of driving them away from him? What do we need to do? Well, we Presbyterians naturally turn to the next thing that Paul mentions in verse 2, the manifestation of the truth. The truth. Oh, we spend a lot of time and effort on the truth, don't we? Making sure that our teaching and ruling elders know the truth about Christ. We have established schools and colleges all over the country so that people learn how to read and so they can learn the truth. We insist that our teaching elders go to seminary and we examine all of our elders to ensure that they understand the scriptures, that they believe our confessional standards. Oh yes, we know all about the truth. And with all of this very necessary focus on the truth, sometimes we can be a little smug. Sometimes we can assume that if only those other denominations would get their theological ducks in a row, well, they wouldn't have these sorts of problems, bless their hearts. Well, if that's what we conservative EPC types think, we might better look in the mirror. <laughs> 
I mean, just in our presbytery alone, we've had two pastors whose ministries were brought to an end by moral failings, and that's just in the last few years. Y'all, just embracing the right confessional standards, just holding a correct doctrine of Scripture is not enough to keep anyone from falling prey to fleshly temptations. Now, truth is important, but there's another important part of manifesting, of revealing the sort of truth that Paul mentions in verse 2, and that is integrity. Integrity. It turns out it's not just enough to believe the right things. We also have to live according to those things. It's not enough just to talk the talk. you got to walk the walk. Oh, and by the way, integrity is one of the most important keys to effective evangelism, isn't it? And that's especially true where our younger generation is concerned. After all, many of them prize authenticity or what they call being real. That's the highest good. That's the most important character trait to them. And let's be honest. They have a reason for that. These are digital natives. And in our age of omnipresent cell phone video recordings and Facebook live streaming and instant publication of all of this stuff on social media, authenticity, transparency, integrity, living according to your standards, consistent Christian living is really the only option available anymore. Another headline, just this last week, you may have heard of a young man named Trevor Lawrence, quarterback of the Clemson football team. You saw him play in the national championship game. By the way, in a sermon on humility, um, Clemson did a pretty good job of humbling the University of Alabama, didn't they? Well, anyway, Trevor is an amazing athlete. He's also publicly professed faith in Jesus Christ. But he's a 19-year-old freshman. And just this week, Trevor was playing in an intramural basketball game. And, of course, there were lots of people watching and videoing. And Trevor was caught on camera shoving someone who tried to set a pick on him. Now, I don't know much about basketball, but I wouldn't try to set a pick on a guy who's like six foot six. Anyway, we don't know exactly what happened. We don't know what was said between these two young men. We don't know what else might have happened during the game that prompted this exchange, but it didn't matter, did it? The video was made. The video was picked up by the national media. And even though none of us knows the whole story, and never will, you know that some folks are going to look at that video, and they're going to look at Trevor, and they're going to say, well, that's how Christians act. however unfair that might be. Like it or not, all of us Christians are on candid camera all the time. The watching world is always looking for an opportunity to look at us and call us a bunch of hypocrites so they don't have to take seriously what Jesus says. So living a life of transparency is just necessary these days. But this kind of integrity has always been important for church leaders. I mean, we shouldn't expect anyone to listen to what we say if we're not living it out, right? That's a big part of what Paul is doing in this passage. That's why he commends himself to everyone's conscience in verse 2. Paul is appealing to what they know about him, about his life. And it had to be a lot because he was the organizing pastor of the church in Corinth. And given how often they must have heard him preach and teach, they had to know the depth and the breadth of his knowledge of the scriptures. They had to know a lot about Paul. <laughs> and come to think of it, they also had to know, as anyone can tell from reading anything that Paul wrote, that he was a straight shooter, that he called it like he saw it, and he didn't pull any punches. But in verse 2, Paul also wants them to remember the example he was trying to set for them. An example that was the opposite of the dishonesty and the craftiness and the deceit and the selfishness that was all too common among church leaders of that time 
and unfortunately is still too common in the church today. So, what is the remedy for defective leadership? How can all of us who have been called into the church of Jesus Christ more clearly manifest his word, not only with our lips, but with our lives? How can we be as transparent as we are truthful? How can we live lives of integrity? How can we do it? Well, here's an example I often used with my cadets. I used to tell them this. Okay, thought experiment. I do not want you to think about pizza. Okay? Don't think about pizza. Don't think about pepperoni. Don't think about cheese. Don't think about deep dish or crispy crust. What are you thinking about? Pizza. Yeah, okay. Look, you can't not think about something. You can't. Instead, you have to think about something else. You have to shift your focus. That is what Paul is telling us in verse 5. If we want to have lives of integrity, if we want to bear a truthful, transparent witness for Christ, if we want to live a consistent Christian life that is in line with what we say we believe, we have to stop thinking about ourselves We have to stop thinking about our needs. We have to start thinking about Jesus himself instead. We have to preach not ourselves, but Jesus, the Messiah, the Lord. And if I may quote a Southern Baptist pastor, Rick Warren put it this way in the opening sentences of his best-selling book, The Purpose Driven Life. Pastor Rick Warren says, It is not about you. The purpose of your life is far greater than your own personal fulfillment, your peace of mind, or even your happiness. It's far greater than your family, your career, or even your wildest dreams and ambitions. If you want to know why you were placed on this planet, you must begin with God. You were born by His purpose and for His purpose. Thus far, Rick Warren. And that is what Paul is getting at in verse 5. It's Jesus who is the Christ. That means he's the promised Messiah. He's the one who rules and who reigns over all of us. But not only that, Paul says, Jesus is the Lord. That means he is the Son of God. He is the one through whom everything came into being. He is the one who holds the whole universe together. And so given who Jesus is, it just makes sense that all of our speaking and all of our living must not be for ourselves. Everything we say, everything we do must be for Jesus. It's got to be all Jesus all the time, 24-7, 365. And any Christian, leader or layman alike, who misses this point, Anyone who still clings to the notion that this life is all about us and all about our happiness will eventually end up living the same sort of selfish lie that has caused so many of the scandals all over the church throughout history and around the world today. Okay, but... How does understanding that Jesus is the Messiah, how does, how does really understanding that Jesus is the Lord, how does this transform the way we see ourselves? How does this promote Christian integrity? How does this help us live lives of transparency and truth? Well, instead of the sort of selfish pride that has led so many church leaders to take advantage of other people, Instead of that mindset, a focus on the authority and the divinity of Christ should create in each one of us a profound sense of humility. Humility. Now look, this sort of thing did not come any easier to Paul than it does for us. I mean, Paul was one of the most learned rabbis of the day. But not only that. Because he had the key to unlock the the true meaning of the Old Testament. Paul 
understood the Old Testament scriptures in a depth and a breadth that, that no rabbi at the time could possibly match. He was leagues ahead of them all. But as Paul explains in verse 6, the only reason he knew anything about Jesus was because of that experience he had on the road to Damascus. When Jesus appeared to him in a blinding light and impressed upon him the truth of the resurrection and the ascension of Christ, as well as the reality of Jesus' oneness with all who trust in him. Everything, everything Paul knew about the scriptures and about Jesus flowed out of that experience. An experience Paul had nothing to do with. An experience Paul didn't want at the time. So, instead of being proud of his immense learning, in humility, Paul gave all the glory to God for everything he knew about Christ. And that humility before God led to an equally sincere humility before the people he was called to serve. Now, again, that kind of humility didn't come naturally to Paul. I mean, after all, he was an apostle, right? He had done miracles of healing, as the book of Acts says. He had been the organizing pastor of the church he was writing to. But did you notice in verse 5, he doesn't insist on any of those titles, how, however much he deserved all of them. What does he call himself? Their servant. Their servant. In fact, in the Greek, this, this word is even more astounding because it, it means a bond slave. Isn't that amazing? Instead of lording his knowledge and wisdom and authority over the Corinthians, Paul says, I'm your slave. That's humility. True humility toward God. True humility toward other members of the church. Isn't, wouldn't an attitude like that among church leaders, just imagine if all church leaders had that kind of an attitude, wouldn't that make the kind of abuses we hear so much about just unthinkable? I mean, have you ever heard of a slave abusing his master? So if all of us, leaders and laymen alike, really, if we all really consider our brothers and sisters in Christ to be more important than we are, if, if we were all consistently seeking to better our brothers and our sisters' condition, regardless of the cost to ourselves, wouldn't that kind of attitude take care of our integrity problem? I mean, the idea of taking advantage of someone that you think is more important than you and that you would do anything for, well, that would never enter our minds. But there's one other reason that humility is critical for all church leaders. It's the best way to reveal the glory of God to the world. Now, I know. We usually give the pastor all the credit for a growing, vibrant church, don't we? And we give the pastor all the blame for a church that isn't doing so well. But it's this sort of tendency to put a pastor up on a pedestal that has encouraged so much of the abuse we see in the church today. But Paul will have none of this, none of this sort of adulation. Instead, in verse 7, he insists that in spite of his great learning... In spite of his great insight, in spite of the miracles of healing he had accomplished, he was nothing more than an earthen vessel, not any more valuable than a clay pot. The real treasure, Paul says, is what's inside the pot. The glory of God in the face of Christ. It's the wisdom and the power of God not the slick, polished presentation that made Paul's ministry possible. It was all about God. It wasn't about Paul. And come to think of it, could there be any other way to follow Jesus? <laughs> For he didn't reveal the glory of God in the showy way that would have impressed the religious leaders of his time, did he? No, 
Those leaders who in their pride looked down on everyday people and said, oh, we know more than you do. They didn't think much of Jesus. And according to the world's priorities, why should they? He was born into a working class family. He hung out with tax collectors and sinners. He was even willing to touch an unclean leper. And he chose to lay down his life on the cross to die a criminal's death between two thieves. According to every worldly measure, Jesus was nothing more than a loser. But it was because he humbled himself before God. Because he humbled himself in the sight of sinners like us. It was because he refused to take advantage of his divine might and majesty to please himself. It's because of that that all who trust in him have received such tremendous blessings. We have received forgiveness of our sins. We have received righteousness in the sight of God. We have seen the glory of God through the humility of Christ. As Paul says in our responsive reading from Philippians chapter 2, it was because Jesus humbled himself and became a servant to all of us that we have the hope of the resurrection and eternal life with God forever. So how could we possibly follow such a Savior in a selfish way? How could we reflect the glory of a humble king by taking advantage of others, by thinking it's all about us. No. The only way to follow Jesus is to do what he did. In true humility, putting aside our wants and even our needs so that others might be blessed. That's the only way to get the focus on him. That's the only way to give him the glory and the honor that he deserves. Let us pray. Lord, we are naturally very proud people. We want what we want and we want it right now. And sometimes, Lord, we have to confess that we run over other folks who aren't going along with what we think is best, or what we want, what we think is right. And we've seen how an attitude like that can tear up a church or tear up a family. Lord, forgive us. Help us learn from Jesus what it really means to live a life devoted to you, to live a life devoted to others, to live a life of integrity, a life that is consistent with our profession of faith. Help us truly submit ourselves to the Lordship of Christ in every way giving you thanks and praise for the great sacrifice He has made for us. For we offer this prayer in His name and for His sake. Amen.